Hi, everyone. Welcome uh, to Sip Tequila TV. I'm Carolyn Kissick. I'm our Director of Consumer Events and Education here at SipTequila.com. And I'm here with my friend Susan Koss, who is one of the co-founders of Mezcalistas. Hi, Susan. Hello, Carolyn. It is so nice <laughs> to see you. <laughs> you too. Um, we're actually in different countries right now. Susan's in uh, the Bay Area and I'm down here in Guadalajara, Mexico. And we're getting together today to learn a little bit about Mezcal because I know a lot of you watching this are tequila heads, getting interested in other agave spirits. And uh, the best way to learn is from the source. And Susan is just that. So um, thanks for being here today. Why don't you give us just a little bit of a background on what Mezcalistas does, how you got started, like how did you find your way to the agave world? Well, I will say first, Mezcalistas were a media events and consulting company. It took a long time for us to come up with that concise language as to what we do, <laughs> because we started as a, a passion project, as most Mezcal things do start. Um, I had the incredible luck um, and uh, ability to visit Oaxaca in 2003. Um, I had heard about it. I wanted to understand more about Mexican food, about corn. So I planned this trip. Uh, it happened to coincide with Dia de los Muertos. Setting, I was setting up, you know, visits and uh, cooking classes with different chefs just to try and understand. And then my mother invited herself along. We went to Oaxaca. <laughs> we had an amazing time. Um, Dia de los Muertos was incredible. And um, I got to try mezcal. Um, I had heard about it and especially heard a lot about it when I was there in the city. And um, so the first time I had it, it was in the, the main market in the city centro. And, you know, there are a whole bunch of different stands there. And I, I took a sip and I was just like, oh, really, this is what everybody's talking about? I don't really like this so much. Um, and I just, I didn't know it at the time, but what I'd had was very much an industrial mezcal. Um, so the next time we were, I, we were at a Dia de los Muertos party at the cemetery and a comparsa came in and, you know, it was wild and crazy and there was music and they had a, a bottle of mezcal and they were passing around shots. And I took a sip and I was like, holy cow, what is this? Um, it was delicious. And from there, I wanted to understand more about it. The third time on that trip uh, that I had a chance to try mezcal was uh, a few of us had hired a car to go out to Teotitlan del Valle. Um, and on our way leaving, so this is 2003, the roads weren't great. There were a lot of deep dirt roads in Teotitlan de Valle. I just want to say this, just for context of how much has <laughs> happened in 17 years. Yeah. Um, and so I asked the driver, hey, where's a good place to try mezcal? And he, he, he was just like, he stops the car in the middle of the road. He's like, oh, you want to try a good mezcal? And I said, yeah. So he turns the car around. We end up going down this bumpy dirt road. We end up in front of some steel gate garage, not on the door and the door opens and this man is standing there um, and he and the driver are speaking in gruff voices then he lets us in and as it turns out it was Ron Cooper of Del Miguel Mescal. So my official awesome. first time tasting Mescal was with Ron Cooper who at that point was just desperately trying to get Mescal into the market. Um, and so from there the interest was sparked, the intersection with culture and food you know, how I was introduced to it those three different times. Um, and then I found myself in a position of being able to go back to Oaxaca um, to live there for two months at a time um, due to the work that I was doing, which was in the food world, and I could work remotely. Um, and then as I got to know more chefs, I started visiting out uh, to Palenque's, uh, understanding more about the production of mezcal, meeting different makers, um, and I, you know, I'm a writer as a background. And so I just started writing about these experiences. Um, and then eventually met, uh, Max Groni, who's the co-founder of Mascalistas when he and his wife were in, uh, Oaxaca on vacation. I knew his wife from the Bay area from work and we all got together. I introduced Mascal to Max. He'd been a tequila person. He fell in love 
we went out and visited Palenque's and at the end of the trip, he was like, Hey, we should start a blog about mescal. And I was like, sure, that sounds great. I don't know anything about that. I don't know how to do it. And he's like, I do. And you know, three months later we launched the mescalistas blog. Um, the name is a riff on Sandinista. Um, you know, we just thought it would be fun. We're like, yes, revolutionaries all about yeah. mescal. Um, and then our tagline you know, is just, we like mescal and think you should too, which was, I think, you know, from our very humble beginnings, it's like, oh my God, this stuff is so great. Everybody else needs to know about it. Um, yeah. So that's the long story of how we came to be. And then it started as this passion project. We did tastings out of my apartment in San Francisco starting in 2012. Um, we wrote about the... The, the industry, I think we had three readers, my mother, Max's wife, and Ron Cooper, who was very quick to send us emails when we got something wrong. Um, and um, we just grew from there. We did underground tasting events um, at a gallery, art gallery in the Mission, and those eventually morphed into the Mexico in a Bottle events that we now do all across the country. Um, so this is for, as for everyone, 2020 has been incredibly challenging, um, because, you know, as we became a formal business that happened around 2016, um, where we actually started looking at it like a business and not just, oh, let's just write and have these events. Um, you know, uh, our revenue stream comes from events, uh, mm -hmm. the blog, it's not a subscription model, um, and uh, so much like everybody else in the industry, we're seeing that 70 to 80 percent hit on revenues and are making adjustments going forward, doing more obviously virtual stuff. Um, and then just, you know, trying to figure it out how we can be here on the other end as things open because there's a lot of mezcal that's accumulating in Mexico and there are a lot of people here on this market who want to drink it. And now it's just connecting those two markets going forward once again. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a, it's been a strange year. That's for sure. That's like the, the minimum way of saying it. Um, but you know, I'm excited to get everyone back together again because I think we'll actually enjoy the experience of being together so much more than, you know, I know at least for me being from the Bay Area, we were so lucky to have access to so many of these agave spirits so early on, you know, like there's a lot of places in the States that still don't get any of these spirits and we've been drinking them for years and years and years. And so I'm hoping that, um, you know, kind of the, the play towards e-commerce will actually expand the reach um or the ability you know of smaller producers to get to more places in the states uh and the worldwide obviously um but agreed uh, that I mean, might I be think, the one you know, silver lining out of this right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean you know it's been the the interesting thing is you know the mescal category is is so new in the spirits world it's it's so new it's still tiny it's less than two percent of the alcohol market i mean it is tiny and so the emphasis had always been on on you know selling product through bars and restaurants that that was people's touch point um and so having that sector closed down you know, really shut off um, how mescal brands and companies were able to sell to people um, or to even give people the opportunity to try before they would buy a bottle. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I mean, that's the challenging thing of now having to shift to this retail driven market when people don't have the opportunity to try something um, where the price points rightfully so of mescal bottles is higher than pretty much everything else in in spirits world um so it's like how how do you get a consumer to understand all of the things about it you know why it's so expensive why the flavors are all over the place um so that they will take that next step and want to buy a bottle that may cost eighty dollars um yeah and you know i mean and it's it's a huge transition and brands you know are really are really finding um, innovative ways to do it. And I will say probably one of the most positive things I have seen come out of this year is the amount of incredible mescal 
that is available in 200 milliliter bottles now. Yes. Um, so, I mean, you know, it's like that is the perfect way to get people who are curious to try something. So they can try three different mescals for previously what would have been the cost of one bottle. Um, yeah. And this is the way we can continue to, to get people to really understand um, yeah. just how, how huge the market is with yeah. the flavors, et cetera. Right. And I think I'm seeing some people in tequila actually take note of that a little bit as well, understanding, um, you know, that this, this market is so big and there's so many different flavors, obviously way more in Mezcal than there is in the tequila world. But let's, let's talk a little bit about why that is <laughs> and where that came from. Because as you were talking about being down here in 2003 and dirt roads, you know, I started coming down in 2009 and it was sort of the same thing. There were, you know, there was no like emailing someone and telling them that you were going to come for a visit. It was like you drove down the dirt road, you honked at the distillery and you hoped that someone had their flip phone, you know, when your driver had their phone right. number and only <laughs> the only person that had their phone number was your driver and that kind of stuff. And, you know, that was, that was 12 or, you know, 11 years ago for me, you know, 17 years ago for you. And there's so much that's changed in just that amount of time, but let's go back before that, you know, where did, where did Mezcal really, come from um you know i know that there's a little bit of like a divide in like how the distillation um processes split off you know between uh the different you know methodologies for distillation but where did this where did this really start um culturally and even geographically um and how has that expanded to what it means to be mezcal now well, I mean, the thing, that, the thing that I love about Mescal is how many spirits come with an origin story, like a myth story. I think, I think maybe wine is the only other one, and it's, you know, and they're interconnected when talking about flavors and profile, like all of that. Um, but, you know, the, the mythology of Mescal is, you know, star-crossed lovers, um, that, you know, ran afoul of a grandmother. Um, they tried to hide. Uh, Maya well, the goddess of fertility, um, was killed in the battle that ensued. Um, and, you know, where she was buried, uh, her lover, her lover Quetzalcoatl, uh, you know, stood over this place. It's a beverage pulque. Um, and it really... Um, and it, that gave rise to eventually um, the cooking of the agave hearts and the distillation of it. Um, so, I mean, it comes with this incredibly, like, romantic, tragic story. Um, we joke around that a bottle of mezcal is like um, life and death in a bottle, you know, because yeah. um, it just, it has that great story. Um, right. Culturally, like, the agave plants, uh, much like um, maize, corn in Mexico, um, has been an incredible staple of, you know, diet and building materials and being able to use the fibers of the leaves, the pancas, um, for things like rope and threads and clothing. Um, you know, you could eat uh, some of the agave. Certainly you could drink, um, drink it. So I always jokingly say it's, you know, think of the agave as like whole animal butchery. You know, it's like you use every part of it right. because when you harvest the agave, you are killing it. Um, you know, it's coming, it's come to the end of its life cycle and here it is being remade into something else. Um, and, you know, historically speaking, uh, because agave is found throughout Mexico, um, it has agave distillates, distillates have been made throughout Mexico. Um, and mezcal is really just synonymous with, you know, something that has been distilled from agave. Um, and it's, you know, it has been in recent history that we have seen the introduction of denominaciones de origen, which has kind of divided up the space a little bit to give, you know, acknowledgement to, you know, initially, um, I think the idea was a specific place and production style. Um, and, you know, so it's, you have tequila, you have mezcal, you have resia, you have bacanora. Um, and, you know, to pay homage to the differences among those, I think that, 
you know, there's a lot of discussion in Mexico exactly about what a denominación uh, de origen means now, mm -hmm. uh, but that was the intention of it. So Mezcal's Dio, denominación, came into being in 1994. Um, and rules and regulations were set down about what that meant and what states uh, could be included in that DO. Um, traditionally, this was a product that had been made in indigenous communities throughout Mexico. And the state of Oaxaca just happened to have one of the largest continuous productions of it. So it has been a primary producer of mezcal as it has come further into the market. But you now have eight other states in Mexico that have denominación. Um, but Oaxaca still is the primary producer at I think about 80 or 85 percent of all mezcal in the market. Um, the question as to when distillation arrives in Mexico is, is one that is <laughs> in academic conversation right now. Mm -hmm. Did the distillation idea arrive with the Spanish? Um, did it exist prior to it? I know that there have been studies done by uh, Patricia Colinga in um, Colima um, about some discoveries made there. It is still under research, so we don't know. But we know that distillation has been happening in Mexico for at least 500 years. Yeah, that's so. kind of, um, just to note this, if you're watching and you don't know a lot about um, the history of Mexico, there's a lot of undocumented things here that you may be looking for an answer on. Like I get question, I get really specific questions all the time. And I'm like, I don't have the answer for you and no one has the answer for you. And for me, that's a little bit of magic about right. what we're doing and where it comes from. You know, it's the question of like, well, who taught you how to distill? Well, I've been doing this since I was a kid and my dad was doing it since he was a kid. And I don't know, we can only think back as far as we know our family history. And it's not like someone showed up one day and was like, here's how you do everything. Um, so I, I kind of, you know, if you're looking for really specific answers in tequila or mezcal or kind of uh, some of the history in Mexico, it, it bleeds quickly from facts into lore, which I think is wonderful. Um, I yeah. think there's a lot of, room for mystery that's that's okay and it, it makes the, the experience of all of these products better for me anyways i mean it is so true and it's you know also trying to understand you know sometimes the why well why is it done this way mm -hmm. um and you know the answers that i have gotten as i visited different places can vary a little bit and it reminds me of you know this old joke story um about um briskets getting cuts, um, their ends getting cuts um, as they're being cooked for Passover. And it was just like, why, why, why is that happening? And then it turned out it was because somebody's grand, you know, great grandparent or something like that didn't have an, a big enough pan to fit the brisket so they would cut off the ends. And this is just the knowledge that got passed down. Right. And, you know, and I feel like there's some of that that happens, you know, um, and, you know, it's, which is why it's always hard for, for me to say, you know, well, this is right or this is wrong. It's just like, yeah. you know, this is just how it's developed over time in different places. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I like that. And I think that's one of the reasons you and I have seen eye to eye on a lot of things is we're more category stewards than we are specific to mm -hmm. one production method. And really, when you get deep down in it, it's impossible to say that one thing is better or more accurate than another because there's so there's so much variety there's so much variety and every new you know even now is like younger people are coming into process making they're doing it differently than even the people that they learned it from and so right. you know just to go back to emphasize that like if you're looking for perfection this might not be the spirits category <laughs> for you um because you really kind of create your own ideal of what you like. And that's, that's great. It gives you a lot of, um, a lot of opportunity yes. to do, to do whatever you want. You know, you would, you would be very challenged to find, you know, a perfect understanding. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's like in the making of mezcal, there are 30 some different types of agaves that you can use in the production. Um, and maybe it's not even 30, maybe it's more, maybe it's less, but you know, because you have, um, the regional differences and, you know, an agave that might be called or spelled something somewhere is different somewhere else. And then it's like, well, are they the same 
Well, maybe not because with pollination, they're slightly different, you know, so it's, there's, there's just no absolutes. And I think, you know, something that I have really learned and I learned early um, was to just shut up and listen when I was going places um, and, and to try and release myself from any preconceived ideas I had um, or, you know, understandings that I had. I mean, one major thing is because Oaxaca has dominated the production of mezcal, um, it is oftentimes assumed that that is the production method, um, mm -hmm. that what happens in Oaxaca is how mezcal is produced in other places. And it's not, it varies. It also varies within Oaxaca itself. Um, right. You know, so it's, you know, so they're just these things where it's like what happens in Oaxaca is completely different. What happens in Durango, the idea, you know, of, harvest, roast, crush, ferment, um, distill is the, the thing that links everything. But the nuances and how it, that happens is very different. Um, yeah. And, you know, and that's what makes mezcal so amazing and incredible. And, you know, the, just the flavor varieties that you get, um, just the, the history from within each of the communities of how things have been done. Um, so it's like, it's like this never ending onion, like with layer after layer after layer of, you know, you think at some point it's going to end and it's like, nope, here we go. Here's another layer. And yeah. I will say every time I go to Mexico, I learn at least three new things. Um, so, and sometimes the three new things I learn, um, contradict the previous three new things that I had learned, you know? Yes. So that is a very good point. <laughs> that is a very good point. Um, you know, because I'm, you know, I learn something new every time I go to a distillery and I'm going to multiple a week at this point. And it's, I think the contradictory piece is the thing that I've had to like, just let go and just say, I, why would I be the one that says that you have to define how you're going to make this every single time and say that you have to make it this way every single time? Like, that's not up to me. You know, chefs, like chefs cook food sure in a general way but i guarantee you even if you went to i don't know i'm going to say peter luger i don't know why i'm going to use that as an, <laughs> as an example but i bet you they're cooking steaks very similarly to the way they started cooking steaks but that over time that's changed with equipment yeah. and accessibility and who's behind you know the oven or the the grill top and and that's okay you know i think that's one of the things that i'm really trying to educate people on this is like it's not up to us to say how it gets produced. It's up to the person that's producing it, how they want to do it. And yeah. if you choose to continue to drink that, that's great. And if you don't, you can find something else. Um, but, yeah. I know. Um, it's a, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a challenging thing. And, you know, it's like I say to people, um, there are four ingredients in mezcal, um, you know, and it's like it's water, air, agave, and the hands of the maker. And oh, all like of those that. are constantly changing. Um, and so, you know, it's like flavors are going to change. Um, I mean, I, I very much believe that there needs to be some rules and structure, you know, yes. in terms of how the different categories are defined. Um, and, you know, and I think it's important to, you know, pay homage to those different, um, production styles. Um, I don't know if, Eventually, we will see appellations that adhere to, like, the production style is very different, say, in Catalina, um, Santa Catalina Minas in, in Oaxaca versus a production style um, in Ajutla, which is just on the other side of the mountain or just down the valley, um, right. and different appellations there um, because it just it varies so much. And, again, it is, you know, these were communities – that um, accessibility uh, was a challenge. And so things just developed on their own there and the different styles and obviously the geography, the type of agaves that were growing there. I mean, just everything came to influence how something was made and right. what, how that Im kind of imbued the flavor. Yeah. Um, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, and there's things so. that happen that are, I fully agree that there, there needs to be structures and like respect paid to certain things. And there shouldn't be like massive adulteration happening um, in this process, especially because, you know, ultimately that affects the consumer and 
Um, I'm very big on, you know, transparency from, from start to finish, but yeah. I was out Although, visiting or go ahead. No, I was going to say, I think that, you know, things can happen as they will. This is going to your point of transparency. Um, but you know, it's just, we just have to understand we, the consumer, um, and you know, we have to be taught that there are repercussions and consequences of any time you shift to a large scale production. And right. those can be, you know, impacts on your inputs, um, which how, you know, the agave is farmed, how water is used, you know, how people are paid, like all of that. Um, and as well as on the byproducts and the amounts of, of waste, environmental impact that that has, and then how it changes the flavor. Um, right. Ultimately, it is up to the consumer to decide what it is they want to be drinking. Um, right. And, you know, again, like you, uh, the transparency of them being able to have access to the information to understand more um, about that particular bottle of mescal or brand or, you know, whatever. So, right. <clears throat> so that's actually a perfect segue into um, something that I would love for you to talk a little bit about is say I'm new to the category. Uh, mm -hmm. This is something that I think the Mezcal category is doing really well in terms of putting a lot of information on the label. Obviously, um, sites like Mezcalistas are great uh, sources of information for this, but where do I even start if, you know, say I'm new to the Mezcal category? Like what, uh, I know this is a difficult question because I could ask this as well, <laughs> but, um, you know, what are some best practices or maybe you could talk just a little bit about some of the more commonly found um, expressions that mm -hmm. uh, people would see and then, uh, you know, price and what to maybe look for on the label, uh, you know, in your opinion of, of where someone could start. Uh, in this journey. Okay. And I know you have some uh, copitas over there and uh, <laughs> celadoras. And, uh, yeah, the, the whole thing, the collection. I mean, I would say, you know, um, really and truly the, the entryway that most people come to Menskal is through cocktails. Um, and um, you were seeing that happen in bars and restaurants around the country that develop these great agave programs. And, you know, so people would have a best called cocktail that would pique their curiosity and then they might start moving into other things. Mm -hmm. So the thing about, you know, um, mezcal, uh, cocktail mezcal, um, is it is produced more to be a volume product. Um, and, you know, and so that's going to impact some of the flavor. Um, the production processes, um, for the most part, are going to adhere to what has been defined as more traditional production processes, which is, you know, to say that they are, they are cooked um, in an oven either below ground. Oh, <laughs> Sorry. <food>. Um, <laughs> In an oven below ground or in a brick oven um, that's going to get a roast flavor. They're not steamed, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, you know, and then from there, again, uh, after they're cooked, getting crushed, uh, then getting fermented, then getting distilled. Um, and, you know, so that is, that is a traditional production process um, there. Um, and, Oftentimes, you know, you have some examples of mezcal brands that just expand that. So you have more ovens, you have more crushing ability, you have more tinas where things are being fermented, you have more stills. Um, other places, they, you know, they look at how they can make more efficient um, production process. So, you know, there's, there's variations within that. Um, but, you know, the, the brands that most people have heard of, you know, are going to be um, Vida or El Silencio or Illegal, um, Sombra, uh, Banez, um, that bars, you know, will use in making their cocktails. Um, most of the time people are going to be introduced to a mezcal that's made from an Espadín agave, mm -hmm. um, which is the, the workhorse of mezcal world. Um, it can be easily cultivated, much like with a Tequilina Weber. Um, and, you know, and it grows in seven years. Um, so, and because that is the workhorse in Oaxaca, which, again, produces the bulk of mezcal in the market, um, you're just going to get a lot more espadine. 
Um, right. And I so think, let me let me just oh, ask stop. you a question yeah. here because I'd love to um, just make this point. Is um, if you're familiar with tequila, you know, it's, we generally say seven to ten years to grow uh, to be mature. Honestly, we're seeing things harvested between five and seven right now. But you mentioned espadine takes seven years. But let's talk just really quickly about how long some of the other agaves in mezcal can take to grow to contrast why why the espadine is that yeah. Um, yeah yes because um wild agaves um the ones that aren't deliberately cultivated um can take anywhere from 10 to 27 years um to grow uh, so yes, this is why the espadine, um, is valued. It's also yeah. valued too, because it has a high sugar content. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, and that's an important thing when you're making alcohol, what the sugar content is. Um, people have, I, I, I have been disappointed to see that, you know, you, you see a dismissal of espadine, like, oh, it's just an espadine where for me, like, it is such an amazing like way to understand, you know, for lack of a better word, the terroir of mescal, because it mm -hmm. depends on, you know, those four things, those four ingredients that I talked about before, like, you know, the water, the air, the hands of the maker, um, what's the water source that's going into it? What happens to be in the air during the wild fermentation process, open fermentation process that happens? Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, the soil content uh, influences the, the growth of the agave and how those sugars and flavors are developed. Um, so, I mean, you know, so the espadine is the easiest way to like understand the differences in things. So you can get an espadine from Matitlan um, versus an espadine from, you know, San Dionisio Cotopec. They're very close, like distance wise, mm -hmm. um, but they're very different in their flavors. Um, sure. And, you know, and I love that. Um, they're, you know, it's like good brands to start with. Well, if you, if you're looking for, you know, predominantly making cocktails, I would say buy three different, three or four different mezcals so you can play around with which one you like, you know, flavor wise in, in your cocktails um, because they're very different um, and they will, you know, some might work well for all types of cocktails if you're booze forward or citrus or, you know, something, but others might just work specifically for, you know, one or two types of cocktails. Um, and then when you're, you know, like looking to explore, I mean, start with the espadine, um, try a couple of different, you know, espadines that are out there. There's some really great products in the market um, you know, that are, are between like 45 or $60 of espadines. Like they're great entry points. I know some people might be like, ah, oh my God, $45. Um, yes, it's more expensive than, than tequila. It's more expensive than, you know, like whiskey. Um, but that is because this is a handcrafted product. Um, right. It is incredibly labor intensive. The, the types of machines that have been introduced to help in the, the process are shredders, you know, when, when you're trying to break up the fibers of a cooked agave, you know, and so yeah. it's like, it might go through something that looks very much like a wood chipper, you know, or a leaf shredder or something. I think they're probably the same. Um, yeah. <laughs> and that takes away from the back breaking work of sometimes people using mallets to pound mm -hmm. the cooked agave, um, or, you know, from doing it with the Tahona, the giant steel, uh, steel, sorry, <laughs> stone wheel, um, pulled by a horse, sometimes by a person, you know, I mean, it's mm -hmm. like depending on how small it is. Um, so yes, it should have a higher price point. Also, like you're working with a, the base ingredient that takes so long to grow. Um, and you know, it's, it, and that is a long time use of land, um, where you're not planting other things. Um, the beautiful thing about, you know, the traditional style of growing agave is that it was part of the milpa system. So you were growing it with other things. Mm -hmm. Um, so oftentimes you will see agave fields that in the rows between agaves, there's, you know, there is corn being planted or there are beans or onions or something like that. So you're getting full use out of the land. Um, uh, it also helps with uh, kind of keeping your soil fertile as well. Right. Um, but, you well, know, but and you, the one, have, or the one sorry, part that ahead. you didn't even mention that's backbreaking is harvest. 
Oh yeah, the there harvest. is no, you know, I, I continually get asked, you know, is there, are there big machines that can go through the fields yeah. and harvest these? It's like, no, someone goes out there. I mean, in our case with the COA, you know, obviously in Mezcal, it depends on the, you know, appellation of where you are and sometimes it's machete, but these guys are going out there and I say guys, cause I've literally never seen a, a woman do this at least down here, but, um, you're going out there with a very sharp blade and you're going after a very sharp plant and they're not easy to harvest. They take a very long time to get, to get through the fields. And um, I mean, just that piece alone before you even get to cooking and all that other stuff. It's just all like, of that. It, it's insane. so true. First you have to trim the leaves and then yeah. you let it, you know, then you let it sit and then you'll go right. back a few days later and then you will harvest it. Um, there was one time when I went on an agave harvest and I was just like, Oh, this is so cool. And I, you know, I said to the guy, I'm like, Oh, you know, can I help? And he looked at me and he was just like, Oh, you're not touching a machete. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, yeah, that's so not happening. <laughs> Um, so I have yet to be able to participate in that part, um, of the process, but yes, I, everything about it is, you know, incredibly hard work. Um, so, um, yes, a bottle of mescal is going to cost you a little bit more. I mean, I'm very, aside from the mescal that is made for high volume, like cocktail mescal, um, that, you know, you can, you can get that from 27 to 35 or $36 a bottle. Um, paying less than that, um, is, you know, I would have a huge question about it. Right. Um, but, and then, you know, it's like brands like, um, Alipus, which is a great entry, um, to try mescal, like they're 45 to $50 for a bottle. Um, it's, uh, Bonnez has, you know, really price friendly, you know, kind of, of entry points. Uh, for if you want to try clay pots, you know, something that's been distilled in clay pot, um, Donamato is, you know, a great and reasonable entry point to try something with that um, along those production styles. In other regions, you have La Luna, which has some really, Delicious. you know, very, you know, it's like, and these are, you, these are, these are um, transparent brands, you know, it's like you can see what they're doing. Um, they have, they have information, you know, like on a bottle, Donomato, like I'll just say here, they list out the different things, the region, the production style, you know, like how, how it was distilled, how it was fermented. Um, some, you know, it, it used to be the push to put the actual Mescalero's name on the bottle. Um, there's been some changes around that. Um, some Mescalero's don't want their names on bottles. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, some brands don't want to put names on bottles for fear of poaching. This has become a common practice of somebody who wants to start a brand will look at bottles, they'll see names, um, and then they will go and visit that. I mean, it drives me crazy because I'm like, listen, if you really want to do a mescal brand, like commit to it and go do the research yourself. There's so many producers out there that, you know, aren't, aren't being, you know, utilized um, right. who have beautiful product because everybody wants to go to the same maker, um, right. the same no maker. So, you know, it's like, do your research. Well, um, and getting on the ground and visiting for me, yeah. like part of the reason I moved here is I've done everything that I can do from where I was living, like to truly pay respect, you know, and it's like when you were coming down here for a couple months at a time to truly pay respect to what, to the industry that we work in. You need to come spend some time with the oh. people that are making it and in the culture of where it's being made and consumed and just be on the same earth as everyone else that's in the process. Like it's never going to be the same as you Googling or getting on the phone no, with no, someone. No. Like getting on just the book phone your flight and come yeah. down. Not right now. It's COVID. Stay there. But like yeah, don't come down. later. Come well, down. I mean – they're fixers. Like you can just hire somebody to go out to find you a thousand liters of mescal that you can then, you know, like go through the process, right. export to the U S. Um, it is, uh, I mean, it just, it, it's just, it's one of those things. Um, and I, I fear like for me, um, I am almost as upset about that style of creating a brand um, as I get sometimes with the industrialization that's happening with mescal. Mm -hmm. 
um, yeah. because it, it leads to the same thing. It's only seeing it as a commodity product. Um, right. And I think once mescal is seen only as a, a commodity product, like, like a vodka or something, mm -hmm. then, you know, then you detach it completely from its deep cultural roots and history. And, right. you know, for our Mexico on a bottle events, we, we try to, to pull other things around it. So it's not just a tasting event that happens of, oh, I'm drinking a lot. You know, I get to try a lot of mezcal. It's like we bring, we work with artists to, to have art um, there. We, you know, we work with DJs to create, you know, the sound of the event. We work with restaurants to bring in like that food and, and you know, cocktail sip component just so it feels more complete and we also have programming and talks um, so that you can break it up and you can go hear from people who are doing really cool and interesting things you know the one thing we would love to have more of of course are the actual producers um, but that's that's a whole different conversation um, yeah about yeah politics etc um, but you know but it's like because I, I feel like you have to continually remind people or talk to them about the cultural aspect of it um, yeah. because it is so important um, yeah. in the appreciation part of it. Um, but, um, but yes, but, you know, back to Mescal to try. Um, I mean, there's, I will say a Mescalistas, we have a database. Um, we have tasting notes. Um, you know, I will always say you should be reading us all the time anyhow. Um, but, you know, we try and cover, we try and cover things um, from a bunch of different ways where like the true niche, you know, nerds um, will get something out of uh, what we're writing about. And people who are coming into Mescal um, will be able to find, you know, stuff for them as well. So we, we have a whole section dedicated to like mescal 101 that includes photos and videos and just kind of explanations around the process um and we're we're looking to build you know more around that um, we give explanations about the different ways in which you can tour mescal country in 2021 um, <laughs> 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 Once COVID is kind of, you know, um, run its course. Um, but, you know, it's all just, it's all done to, uh, because we like mass call and we want everybody else to appreciate it as well. Um, and I know yeah. that sounds so naive and desperately earnest, um, but it is true. And that's why, you know, that's why we do it. Um, we have, you know, one thing we've worked very hard on is, is to, to keep mescalistas as a platform um, so that we can bring in different voices and perspectives, uh, which is so important um, in the category. And just to truly be as respectful and mindful as we can, um, because it's, you know, we're talking about somebody else's um, yes. legacy and culture. Um, and, uh, you know, so me getting accustomed to doing interviews and things like that is something totally new because <laughs> it's just like, no, 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 I just want to be in the backgrounds. Like, you know, I'm not a spokesperson. I am not an expert. Um, but, you know, it's, um, I, I just, I, I want to figure out how to get mescal into people's hands. And then they can they can decide whatever journey they want to take um, in terms of the flavors that they like, um, et cetera. You know, when people are like, what's your favorite mezcal? And I'm like, usually the one that's in front of me, which sounds like a cop out. <laughs> but I'm just like, I, I, how would I even begin to like yeah. say, what is my favorite mezcal? Um, you know, I, I personally like big bold giant flavors you know mm -hmm. i like things that explode in my mouth um and you know not everybody likes that i right. i have often said like i, I don't really like tobala <laughs> which is like an anathema you know like yeah. how, do you, how can you not like tobala and i'm like for the most part i just you know the flavors that i have gotten you know in drinking it is not my jam um, yeah but you know and it took me a while to come to tepestate um, because I always had tepestate that was, you know, really perfumey. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I've grown to appreciate it, you know, but that's what happens. Your flavors, your taste buds evolve, you know, right. it's like, and as you train your palate, um, you know, it's like, 
that's when you can really be like, oh, so this kind of agave is, you know, usually going to give me more of that like green grassy flavor, you mm -hmm. know, which I really like, or this one is going to, you know, be a little bit more, you know, minerally, or as I like to say, wet cement like, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> and others are going to be sweet. Um, so right. in trying to get people, you know, in introducing people to mescal, and, you know, sometimes they'll be like, oh, I hate mescal. I had it one time and I'm, I'm always like, I'm pretty sure I know what you had. It was probably Gusano Rojo, right? right. It had the worm in the box. Yeah. Um, you know, they're like, yeah, it's too smoky. I don't like it. And then I'll, you know, I'll just like ask, you know, what kind of flavors do you like? Um, and then I will steer them. Um, I don't know if you know uh, Ernesto Hernandez, who's like a tequila guy. He's um, he's from Jalisco. Um, I think I'm not sure what his family background is, but anyhow, he he knows everybody in the tequila industry. And I happened to overhear him at a tasting event in San Francisco one time when he was like, "Yeah, I'm a tequila guy. I'm not really into mezcal." And I was just like, "Oh, really?" I bet I bet I can find a mezcal that you would like. And, yeah. um, and then I spent part of the evening with him, just like, you know, taking him to some of the different tables. And, and I had no idea who he was or anything like that. It was just, you know, like, I'm going to win somebody over here. Right. Um, and after that, he was just like, wow, I really like mezcal. And now he's become this huge mezcal guy, you know. Awesome. Um, and it's, it's really interesting because oftentimes tequila people aren't mezcal drinkers. Right. Well, and vice versa, you know, like, yeah, I think that's why I enjoy talking with you about this. And my other friends in Moscow is like, there's two very separate communities that are being formed, which is fine. I know everybody has their own tastes and, you know, preferences, but, um, you know, I think it'd be better if we had a more open conversation about what we were drinking and how we're growing things and how we're producing yeah. things and how we're going to protect, um, you know, the, the industries that we work in, uh, you know, as the stewards that we are versus kind of standing on our side yeah. of, you know, the <laughs> like staring askance at one another, just being like, Oh yeah, you're tequila. Um, yeah. I mean, well, it, I, it's intimidating to learn about because once you go down the rabbit hole on one thing, you're like, okay, I think I know everything. And then you're like, I'm going to go learn about that too. Like right. I sort of had to make, the decision a couple of years ago, I was like, am I just going to be a tequila person in terms of like trade? Um, or am I going to learn about everything and try and be an everything person? And I was like, okay, I'm going to stay a tequila person by trade, but I'm going to start learning more about all of these other things. But it's just because I'm still learning things in tequila. Then I'm like, if I start learning things about other things, I'm never going to know, you know, I'm never going to find the, the end of the rabbit hole. So it's, uh, it's fun. You know, I, I look at it as like, man, I have my whole life ahead of me to learn more. And I, I don't know that I'm ever going to learn everything that there is to offer yeah. in these categories. I mean, it is, yeah, I, I assume that I, I never will. Um, I'm okay with that. You know, yeah. it's like, yeah. if I die still with there being some mystery out there, I'm okay. Um, I hope, I hope there's the afterlife and, you know, it's like I can, <laughs> The afterlife involves, you know, like learning the secret. Um, totally. That's, you know, you've, you've lived a good life, Susan. You get to learn the secret of this. Um, <laughs> but um, I'm, you know, I I had been a tequila drinker and a bourbon drinker. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had a terrible reaction to bourbon one time. Um, and so bourbon fell off my my drinking list same time as red wine so you know it's the yeah. the aging process um right. and then with tequila i was always i was always a blanco person and again that mm -hmm. had everything to do with the aging and i remember one time like an old coworker of mine when we were out um and i ordered an el tesoro blanco um Ooh, delicious. and and he looked at me and he this was probably i want to say like 2009 2010 yeah. Um, and he looked at me and he's like, why are you getting a Blanco? You've got to get a Reposado or an Añejo. Like, that's the good stuff. And I was like, because I, I like Blancos, you know, and it was just like, I like Blancos. And the, the bartender is watching this whole exchange. And he finally says to my coworker, I think she knows what she wants. 
And then he proceeded to pour. <laughs> it must have been like three fingers, you know, <laughs> into a giant glass and just hands it to me. And he's like, I think you're going to need this tonight. Um, so, but I mean, you know, so that's to say that what I was tasting then was agave. Um, right. which is why I love the Blancos. You know, it's like you can really taste the agave. Um, yeah. um but I, I have noticed um, that there have been huge changes in a lot of the tequilas that I, I used to drink. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that has to do with, obviously there were changes and in the introduction of diffusers into tequila world. Um, and that coincided also too with me exploring the different types of mezcals that, you know, just had a lot more flavor and a lot more right. variety. Yeah. Um, I have been, you know, in the last couple of years, just because of the work, you know, that we do, I have been able to taste more tequilas, um, tequilas that are kind of focused on um, the more traditional production style. Um, I am so happy that El Tesoro has remained, you know, like a good one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. That's, you know, that would have been really sad if El Tesoro was one of the ones that I was like, oh man, I can't drink that anymore. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, and so, and I think that's definitely, um, an influence that, you know, has come from the mezcal category, um, in yeah. the tequila world where it's kind of like. They're seeing where growth is happening. Not that it is cutting into the tequila category sales at all, but right. they are seeing that there is consumer interest in this more traditionally crafted um, products and, and exploring avenues around that. Yeah, and, and I would say environmental concerns and right. you know all of that. You know, but also like when I first started coming down here, I never saw a young person in a distillery ever, ever. Like it was never young people. And last week I was at El Teculeño and t both of the guys running distillation are yeah. younger than me. And so I think there's a new, I don't want to say there's a new wave in tequila or anything and, you know, justify some of the things that have happened. But what makes me excited is I'm seeing a lot. I was worried that young people were not going to come into the category and work because it is really hard work. You don't get paid particularly yeah. well in some companies, but now there is a shift of younger people coming in and innovation is not going towards larger equipment and more efficiency. It's more, how do we go back to the way that we were making this before and experiment in that direction versus bigger tanks, you know, blast, you know, I mean, I won't even go down the diffuser route there, but um, it makes me hopeful for this category. And I think we do have um, it's called to, to thank for that um, in terms of like looking at a model of growth can happen mm -hmm. category, you know, can expand without sacrificing, um, you know, heritage really. Yeah. Well, I mean, and I think too that, you know, the, the explosive growth of Mescal um, really, really happened because it was the right time at the right place with the right interests of people, you know? So it's like you, you had this whole basis of the farm to table stuff that was happening in the United States and people who were paying more attention to provenance and the craft, you know, you were seeing a rising craft spirits industry in the United States itself. So of course that would translate well to accepting craft products from outside the United States. And also too, you had this new wave of Mexican restaurants opening in different parts of the country that were very high end, you know, that was, and people weren't accustomed to that. You know, it's like, you know, there had been this whole idea that anything from Mexico needed to be inexpensive. Um, or cheap. And it was like, and you had these restaurants that were breaking the molds. Um, and on top of that, you had a young um, Mexican, Mexican American population in the United States that, um, you know, had more disposable income, that was, you know, more tech savvy, and was at a point of really wanting to embrace some of that traditional heritage. Um, 
and here was Mescal. You know, it was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and it came in, and it was, you know, and and it happened also like similarly in Mexico, where the younger people who were embracing Mescal, you know, were like, we're artists, we're, you know, mm -hmm. it's. Um, really looking at it in a different, you know, sort of way um, beyond just, oh, that's the stuff that my grandfather used to drink. You know, it was just like this re, um, uh, recapturing of the historical pride um, at the, you know, at the right time with all of these other things that were happening. Um, so I, you know, I have been thrilled, um, simultaneously thrilled and just like oh god what's going to happen now um yeah. as as mescal has you know grown so much um but you know i there, there's so many people who work in the category and in, in the industry um who are focused on really trying to maintain preserve um this historical kind of tradition um, and also trying to figure out how to, to not make it like a Disneyland attraction, you know, right. where it's like to understand that things evolve, things always evolve, things always change, um, and being accepting of that as well, um, yeah. is, you know, it's a fine, it's a fine balance, but you know, yeah. It's like, it's. <laughs> You know, I want to say it's like romantic, which it is, but it is kind of like a romance at the same time too, right? It's like, it goes, it happens over time. There's ups, there's downs, there's, you know, peaks, valleys, and all of that. And, um, you know, something too is I think we're just still really, really early in all of this. You know, it's so like, early. we're so early, there's going to be so much growth and there's going to be things that we don't even, we can't even see coming, you know, and um, you know, I've enjoyed so much hearing, you know, your perspective on this and, um, you know, I, I'm looking forward to continuing these conversations and going further down, you know, the rabbit hole in, in all of these different dimensions, because, uh, it is very complex. It's very dynamic and mm -hmm. romantic. And, uh, I think you do something very good for the category in terms of just, putting a voice, you know, and writing the stories down um, for the people that aren't writing them down. Uh, Cause I think that's why a lot of the history here doesn't exist is someone just didn't stop and write it down and that's okay. But uh, you know, it's, it's great yeah. to have you doing that for us. I mean, it's amazing. You know, I, I will say that it became the great excuse for me doing what I love to do, which is telling stories. Um, and, you know, and the stories that, you know, I would hear when I would be out doing these, these visits. And this was before I even went with intention, you know, of mescalistas. This was just tagging along with my chef friends was, you know, hearing from voices that would not have access to a larger world, um, whose stories would not be told to a larger world. Um, and that is not me saying, oh, and I told their stories. It was just that, that I had the privilege of hearing these stories that otherwise I never would have heard just given the huge cultural differences. And, you know, and it was such a, a tremendous honor to have somebody take the time um, to actually talk to me, you know, it was just like, wow. Um, yeah. so I feel, I feel incredibly lucky to have, you know, kind of stumbled into this whole thing. Um, but you know, it is, uh, yeah, we'll see what, we'll see what happens. None of us could have predicted 2020 in the pandemic. So, you know, nope. <laughs> nope. you can't, like, you yeah. never know, you never know what's coming down the chute, but, um, Right. Well, the first year you. I was actually going to make money. <laughs> you know, you know, we'll change that. We'll, we'll make that happen. We'll make that happen for you, Susan. Yeah, I know good things are coming for you. But. It's true. The one thing I did want to say is um, for people out there, you know, uh, wanting to try a, a bunch of different mescal, it is a very high proof product. That's um, a great point. Very high proof. So number one, sip it. Don't shoot it, as we like to say. Um, and you need two sips. Um, 
one sip to kind of open your mouth to the intense flavor that you're getting um, to kind of get your mouth accustomed to like the amount of alcohol, you know, ABV that has just gone in. And then, you know, you just kind of like chew on it and then take a second sip because that's where you're really going to get the flavor. Um, and I, you know, people, people use the Vaso Veladora, um, mm -hmm. you know, to try um, or the, the Hikara, which is actually, you know, where it started. Um, people drink out of things that are readily available in the Palenque. So, right. you know, a candle holder, very readily available. Hikara is very readily available. Um, the tops of plastic water bottles, I have, you know, tried stuff out of it. Um, right. Clay, clay copitas. Um, the most brilliant thing ever was this. Um, what this is, is that? My little, this is my little tasting glass. It's so um, cute. It's so cute. I picked this up in Oaxaca at In situ Mascaleria. I mean, just to give you a size, you know, thing. I and this has saved my life because this gives me two sips. <laughs> Two little sips, which is all I, I need in trying stuff. And so I can try a whole bunch of different stuff. I don't blow mm. out my, you know, my palate. Um, it's just the perfect amount. I want to make a ring out of it so I can just, you know, do that. Um, but Sandra, this saved me um, for being able to try a bunch of different things. Um, oh, I love I, it. How do we make tequila a pinkies down <laughs> spirit again? Because I don't know how we all, like, nothing against anyone who's doing this i fully understand it i know the people to develop this class but like how are we all drinking out of verdell glasses like what what happened <laughs> you know um obviously better than a shot glass but one of my goals for 2021 is figure out the new consumable vessel for tequila um without directly ripping off mezcal but i'm definitely going to be inspired that way and you're gonna you don't know my your little uh your little little, little thing <laughs> little like you know little 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 sip there yeah i mean I, for me like they're my hairs go up i get a lot of you know like just natural resistance um when it's like no no white table women's yeah. Um, you know, none of that fancy stuff, uh, mostly because I'm constantly trying to, to mimic my experiences that I've had and how I have tasted mezcal, um, in different parts of, of Mexico. Um, yeah, it has, it does not involve white table linens or fancy glassware. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you, Susan. Thank you so much. Um, hopefully we'll be doing more of these and we can talk about, uh, maybe we'll do a tasting next time and we can yeah. uh, do a, do an experience of a couple of different agaves because I'm not quite so versed just yet, but I would, I would love to experience something like that. That would be um, awesome. With you, uh, everyone who's watching this, make sure you find Mezcalistas, uh, on Instagram, they're also on Facebook. Um, go check out their website. They just launched a brand new website. So congratulations, other fantastic tasting notes on there. And um, yeah, we'll be working with Susan and her, uh, her crew more this year um, to bring these two worlds together. Yes. Thank you so much. I always okay. love talking to you. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Salute everybody. Salute everybody. Bye. <laughs>